improving institutional confidence in ICANN. I have to thank all the um, stalwarts who, have, who are attending here in person. Um, uh, I appreciate we've, we're facing a couple of challenges. One, we're on the schedule, we were put face to face with the draw item of cybercrime, and we're nowhere near as. today. The strategy committee was particularly um, created in December 2005 to give advice to the President and Board on strategic issues facing ICANN um, and since 2006 has focused on our legal status, identity and regional presence um, and its current priority is to facilitate community discussions uh, uh, what else needs to be done to complete confidence in the ICANN model. Uh, and to summarise what's been a whole range of, of, of consultations and inputs we've received, there's basically been a, a series of questions people have asked you know, looking for um, improving institutional confidence. They are, in some order, how to keep the Internet's unique identifier system stable and secure. Um, people's concern that some party may capture ICANN, either be the government's capture ICANN or the contracted parties, contracted, uh, like the registries or the registrars, gain control over ICANN. Um, and uh, these are given as examples of concern that the multi-stakeholder organisation remain balanced across all its stakeholders and not become captive of one particular group. Um, what about accountability, which is an interesting word and in how it gets defined by various people, but people are saying you know, how, do we, how do we ensure this remains accountable? Um, how do we ensure the needs of the global internet community will be met? Um, will it stay secure operationally and financially? How do you make certain that takes place? And how to maintain the bottom-up consensus-based multi-stakeholder model. The Joint Project Agreement itself is a very simple document. It's about two pages long. Um, and in some respects, these questions have emerged more out of, I think, a, bro a broader discussion. So the discussion about the JPA coming to conclusion has driven out more questions about institutional confidence that we're now addressing. So um, the, the, the committee has put forward after its uh, Consultation, some proposals or thoughts around uh, some of these uh, some of these areas, and uh, just to summarise these, 
Um, on the first point, people were concerned about capture. Um, then there was, uh, you know, there's been a push that we maintain consensus or supermajority requirements in in, in uh, voting for policy making, so that you, you can't have one particular group, you know, controlling policy making by bare majority. Um, that there needs to be a broad and diverse participation of affected stakeholders. Um, that it's very important that ICANN be based in jurisdiction which has strong antitrust and competition law, um, and that is actually one of the reasons why the committee and others have said, you know, that the United States remains a very uh, attractive uh, base, base headquarters because of its strong antitrust and competition laws. Um, but we also need to look at ensuring we don't get uh, worried about external capture, and in particular, I think, in that people have been concerned about government capture of the ICANN process. Not government participation is a very different issue, but the question that it becomes completely controlled by only only by governments. Um, on accountability, there's a series of mechanisms already in place in ICANN uh, to make the board re-examine a decision, um, and uh, one of the uh, key areas that I think the committee is, uh, thinks more work to be done is to review those existing structures, resisting um, decision-making proce uh, review processes to see if they can be made more effective. There is a concern that those review mechanisms have a sort of a, a, a continuous loop in the role in which board members play roles in reviewing the decision by the board. And so there's a question there, people wanting to look at um, of a tiered group of uh, these tiered group of review mechanisms to have them reviewed again to see that they are as independent as possible. Um, there's also a proposal put forward by the PSC that the uh, have a board have mechanism to make the board re-examine a decision, and in particular that there be some vote of the supporting organisations and the advisory committees that would say to the board, "We think you got that decision wrong. Please re-examine it." And that there was also put forward after that, that if needs, if needs be, there could be some extraordinary mechanism to remove and replace the board. Um, this, interestingly, this last one um, received a lot of positive feedback 12 months ago, um, but in the last 12 months, it seems to be getting less and less positive feedback. People are more and more concerned that that's, uh, we're getting a lot of expression that people are concerned that's too, that's too uh, volatile and too big a change. Um, and they want more focus on these other mechan uh, gradated mechanisms of accountability. Um, there's a, a lot of feedback uh, from, uh, from um, players, including governments, that the government advisory committee role needs to remain in its present context. That it's, uh, I think as uh, those of you who were here yesterday afternoon in the public session would have heard from uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle, the vice chair, of the GAC, that it's a participant in the formation of the issues of policy making and a participant in its evolution, that it's not a, bo a body that sits in isolation and tells the rest of ICANN what to do. Um, and so that's, that's the sort of use of the word advisory, although we do also recognise that word advisory um, does cause perception problems with other, particularly other government um, officials. Um, there'll be continued periodic reviews of ICANN structure. Um, and of its uh, reconsideration, independent review, and ombudsman functions, we have this ongoing evolutionary process for reviews, um, and that people think that's important. Um, the needs of the global internet community. The question here has arisen: uh, Should there be additional legal presences in other jurisdictions? Um, developing global operations, people are very strongly need to have global operations to meet the needs of a global internet community. Um, and that we have multilingualization of ICANN, particularly improving interpretation and translation services. Um, or, uh, the latter one, of course, is always an issue of expense that has to be managed. Um, in terms of the issues of additional legal presence, the committee is still doing uh, more work on that to bring that to the, bring that to the community, but that's some of the issues that have been put forward. Um, will ICANN stay financially and operationally secure? Um, an interesting piece of feedback here and was put to the committee was that you need to maintain and enhance a, re a reserves policy. ICANN has a reserves policy. Um, I, it, it, it should not go in a straight line continuation. At some stage it needs to come to a conclusion, but it needs to maintain a financial reserve. Um, continued pressure to look for alternative additional sources of income. This is about trying to get diversification of the income stream away from just the registries and the registrars, particularly in the generic top level domain space. Um, so people are still saying that would be useful to diversify. Um, and they also need to build on strategic planning, operational planning and budgeting to ensure inter international organisational best practices are achieved. 
um, and uh, that's, that's a series of issues being put forward about the operational planning and um, budgeting and reporting on the financial uh, allocations, etc. <coughs> How to um, keep the unique identifier system stable. In terms of this review, the United States Government at least has made clear that there are no plans uh, to change the transition from the root zone file in its present tripartite agreements. So basically the procurement contract is not up for this discussion. This is focusing more upon the issues that have come out um, from the notice of inquiry process about how to build institutional confidence for the conclusion of the joint project agreement. Um, we have certainly think it's important that I can continue to discuss operational efficiency measures under the IANA agreement. Um, and we also, you know, the, the committee's also said that it should be important that I can be a thought leader on issues of security and stability issues consistent with its narrow but critical role. And there's already sort of resources being allocated to that. So my colleagues here have led a lot of the consultation process. Um, and to give you some idea of um, how that participation has taken place to date, there was a series of face-to-face -face meetings identified in uh, regions of the world. Um, often around other meetings that were taking place so that we knew people from the region were coming together. So in Montevideo and Uruguay, LACNIC had a meeting which a lot of people from Latin America were coming to, so there was a, so there was a session there. Similarly, um, APNIC had a uh, meeting in Christchurch, New Zealand, well attended from across the Asia Pacific region, particularly from the technical community um, where there was participation. Uh, the IGF preparatory meeting in Geneva a, bit, a little earlier this year, there was a session particularly uh, there. Um, there was quite a big session in Washington, D.C. We've also had one, uh, Pierre helped coordinate one in D Dakar and Senegal, um, and uh, one in Mauritius. Um, we've also had uh, uh, public meetings in, ICANN's public meetings in Paris and Cairo have been places where there's been ongoing consultation on this document. Um, and uh, we've had two online comment periods, June, July 2008 and September, October 2008. Um, and this is, if you like to put it, the most recent round of consultations on these issues. Um, all consultation documents are in 11 languages, and they're all available on that particular um, URL, which is on the screen there at the moment. And there are video audio transcripts for those consultation processes. Um, so some of the things we've heard in, in, in response to that include that internationalization is important in principle, but people want to see more detail and discussion on legal presences, what is needed and why, and we've heard that quite clearly. Um, secondly, um, and we need to respond to that, broad agreement that ICANN needs to be protected against all forms of capture, ex especially external capture, uh, um, that there needs to be more and different board accountability mechanisms needed, and I talked a little bit about that, that people wanted to see more look at those issues of uh, reviewing the existing um, appeal mechanisms to see it makes it more independent. Um, that the GAC should continue to be advisory or that it continues to play that role that Bertrand said of being an active participant in, dis in, in identification of issues early, um, but that is participation, that work on participation. Now the word advisory is, is, is gets interpreted I think by different people in different ways. Um, and so I think we also potentially even could look at that in terms of its wording to make certain we're clear what we mean by that, in that it's active, active participation with the other parts of the community early and issue, issue identification and formation of issues, I think might be a better way of, of, of describing it. Um, that broader participation in ICANN is essential, especially, especially from business, that um, we need to identify additional revenue sources, but only after consulting the community. And so I think uh, there's a tension there, people saying, How, have alternative sources of revenue but um, you need to talk to us first before you think up alternative sources of revenue, uh, which I have to say as president is an in interesting challenge between one and the other. Um, and uh, we've agreed the root zone management agreement should not be part of the consultation. So there's going to be more information to be published. Um, there is a conclusion of what we've called the design phase to take place in January 2009. And then we'll move to publication of an implementation plan for public discussion. Uh, and board review in March 2009. Um, and uh, we need to look at how we implement these measures and we need to report back through the community in 2009. So the design phase period really comes to an end in January and we'll look at having that, uh, then have a publications out in, in, in January about the sort of exact sort of concrete proposals for implementation. 
um, we'll have some further meetings in January ourselves in, um, and have this draft implementation plan for February. A potential timetable then says um, that we uh, review this in March um, and we start looking at implementation in the period between March and June. But we'll have to see, frankly, how the, um, how the um, uh, March, March response to the implementation plans proceeds. All of this is online at, um, at the, that particular uh, URL, ICANN.org. And uh, there's a lot of detail there. There's a lot of material. would really um, uh, exhort people to have a look at that and look at the feedback that's been received. And we very much want to hear your views, both online and, and here today. So perhaps I'll finish with that as a sort of the introduction, and perhaps we can move to questions, and my colleagues will play more of a role in answering them. We've got four questions. Why don't we take the one at the... Okay, and then two, Steve, three, and then four. Okay, yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I missed uh, a reference to the at-large in your presentation. Uh, there will be a so-called at-large summit in Mexico. And what is your, um, what is the, the view of the committee uh, where the at-large should uh, find its um, place in the future icon? Because uh, if, if you go back to the oral history, so the, the, the situation which is there at the moment with a non-voting liaison in the board and a rather complex uh, structure is not so uh, convincing and inviting. Well, I think one of the things which I should have made clear at the beginning is that this particular um, exercise is not the only review mechanism for, for ICANN's ev evolution. And as you're aware, we actually have an at-large uh, uh, formal review process underway which directs itself to some of those questions which also links into the board review that's personally also under the way which also addressed some of those issues so I think we as a committee had said well that air issue is actually seems to be being dealt with fairly directly by those two reviews so that's just we've just sort of said well let's see how, what, how those two reviews work out the gentleman in the back Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm from uh, the Republic of Namibia. I would like just to, uh, to get clarification on two issues. One is um, the JPA concludes in September 2009. Um, I didn't see any indication as to what happened then after that September 2009. Uh, we're going to have a new one and uh, what is the way forward then from there? And secondly, the uh, the gag uh, to maintain to maintain the gag uh, throughout. You 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 refer to uh, to the advisory role being misunderstood. Uh, do you have any views on exactly what what does it then mean within the context of ICANN? Or how do you do you have ideas on what the advisory role is then? Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, the audio was uh, <laughs> pretty. Uh, could you could you take the microphone and repeat the question because it was really not heard. Yet. Yes, uh, there's two questions. One is what happens after September 2009, after the JPA comes to an end or concludes. Secondly, uh, you, ref you refer to the, the, the understanding of the GAC advisory role. Um, it's probably it's misunderstood in a sense, but and it needs to be clarified. But do you, at this stage, as I can, as board or as the, the governing structures of I can, have any idea what what does advisory then mean? Thank you. Thank you. If I if I can answer the the question about the advisory role of the GAC, first of all, as things are now, 
the uh, the GAC has a, a slightly stronger position than the other advisory committees of ICANN in the sense that if GAC gives it, uh, its advice, uh, the board, uh, if they don't intend to follow that advice, they actually have to come back to, uh, to, to GAC and, and give the motivations, give the reasons why they are not, they don't intend to do it. So there is, uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of interaction in that case. Now it has never happened actually that uh, the board would not have followed the, the advice from the GAC. Uh, second, now in the, as part of this consultation process, of course, the governmental advisory committee itself is preparing its comments on the PSC uh, proposal. So, so we really were s still awaiting the view from the GAC itself on what precisely its role should be uh, after the transition. Uh, I, uh, perhaps I can say, being also a member of the GAC, that uh, the, 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 the advisory role, I think that it's generally accepted that the role will be advisory. But of course, within that framework, it, it can be, uh, it can be uh, strengthened in many ways, and one of those ways is actually to, to improve the working methods of the governmental advisory committee itself. Another way to improve or, or make it sort of uh, stronger is to increase the participation, as was also mentioned in these slides, that would, inc that would mean both uh, in terms of having more uh, countries actually as members of the GAC. As things are now, there are 100 countries who are members of the GAC. So it's not, actually, it's not only developed countries. There are many developing countries who are formerly members of the GAC. But then the problem is that uh, only 40, maximum 50 countries at a time participate in the physical meetings of the GAC. So we have to increase that participation. And then we should also, of course, make sure that, uh, that the, those countries that are not yet members of the GAC, that they would, they would see it fit to become members. Thank you. Uh, hello, good morning. My name is Jean-Jacques Subrena, and I'm a member of the board and member of the PSC. Uh, I'll try to answer the question about what happens uh, in September or after September 2009. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that there's a seeming paradox in that ICANN has, <coughs> excuse me, a very limited technical role. But on the other hand, as you can imagine, something like JPA also has uh, political ramifications. So uh, I don't think we at ICANN can really state or imagine what will be the outcome. It depends on many things. Personally, I have heard um, various people of the internet community expressing hopes that the new US administration will have uh, a different, perhaps a more open attitude towards things we are talking about on the PSC, such as internationalization. But uh, I think it's still premature to make any statement about that. What is important is that you should know, the internet community as a whole should know what we in PSC are attempting to do. First of all, we considered it was of prime importance that ICANN should not simply wait until the termination date of JPA comes along and then say, so what do we do? And then turn to uh, the US government and uh, ask for guidance. I think that is not enough. That's why under the uh, leadership of our two co-chairs, uh, we at PSC have been working now in a very active phase since uh, the end of 2007 on proposing 
and I can vision about this transition period. That's really what it's about. So in doing that, I would like to underline that, of course, we bring uh, the uh, ICANN knowledge to it, but that's not enough. There have been, as Paul part, uh, pointed out in his presentation, there have been many uh, uh, opportunities for interaction with the public, with the internet community at large, and uh, with business, with uh, governments, etc. So. Uh, Uriel just pointed out that uh, for the government component, we're still waiting for the official reply or advice from the GAC. But uh, otherwise, there have been many consultations and this will continue. So uh, uh, to sum it up, I would say that JPA right now is uh, a landmark we have to reach and go beyond. But whether or not the other party who is a signatory of the JPA, that is to say the US government, will agree to uh, terminating the JPA at the proposed termination date of September 2009 uh, depends on several factors. One, on the future US administration, of course, but also, I think, on the quality of the work done by B PSC, but also on the feedback from the internet community. And that's why we're here. Thank, thank you. Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. I wanted to make one uh, comment with respect to the Government Advisory Committee, or GAC, because if there's, if there's one element of, of ICANN about which there seems to be a lack of confidence, it, it strikes me that based on Dr. Torre's remarks yesterday, that. There's a lack of confidence that governments have adequate muscle and representation. I think those are the words he used yesterday. And it's, it's a shame that more governments aren't here in the room today, since there's certainly more than 40 governments here at the IGF. Maybe, maybe they're following the security session next door. But I have a, a personal observation, having worked through the Who Is Studies Group over the past couple of years, that you can't really define the GAC's role by um, writing a down a definition. And you have to experience the GAC's role through the way they interact with ICANN. And, and they interact in a fundamentally different way than all of our other stakeholders. Uh, with respect to who is, it, it took them many months to come up with a very formal three-page statement on studies of who is, which they sort of sent to the board and thought th that their job was over. And maybe that's the way the GAC understood it to be. But for the rest of us, it was, it was appropriately handed from the board to the council. The GNSO Council. And what's the surprise there? What part of bottom up consensus driven policy did the GAC not understand, right? Because bottom up would mean that the GNSO Council would work on it. And as we worked on it, we were unable to get the GAC to give us more specifics on what they needed for who is. And they were unwilling to sort of modify their request to fit the parameters of the detailed study that we were doing. We're all engineers in the GNSO, so we tend to think in ways the GAC doesn't like to think. So I only tell that story because I think that the uh, government, government representatives in the GAC were unhappy with what they think the progress has been on who is. And yet, as a person who's been on the inside, you, you can't imagine how hard we worked at GNSO Council to truly take into account everything the GAC was telling us and to continually ask for their uh, further input and participation. But it doesn't seem to be the way they want to work. So if there's anything that the PSC could focus on it moving ahead. It's to, it's to study ways of improving the way in, in real life, the way we work in working groups and the way we work through policy development in a way that the GAC can accommodate it. They are just a different animal and we can't expect them to conform to the way the rest of us do our, do our business. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. I, have, I think I have great news for you because this is exactly, I mean, this way of uh, GAC only interacting at the top and only giving it, as it advice after a long time, maybe a year or two of deliberation. Uh, this is exactly what we, I, I would say both GAC and PSC want to get away from. Because uh, I, th I think that in the forthcoming, forthcoming uh, comments of GAC. I think that there, as also at, in, the, in at the meetings we have had recently, I think that we express the, our desire 
to be part of the PDPs at uh, all levels, actually, uh, instead of just waiting for a long time and then, you know, pontificating, you know, what our views. So we really, and I think that there was a good example of this, the working group on the IDN CC uh, TLD fast track, where, where GAC representatives were actually there. And I think that the working group on the, on the geographical regions will be a similar experience. So I think that this, this, what you pointed out, has been a problem and it will be redeemed. Thank you. Uh, Steve, may I take up perhaps one of the points you made uh, just at the beginning of your presentation? Uh, yes, uh, one of the speakers in the main hall yesterday did uh, defend his thesis that uh, actually GAC is the wrong place for governments to be. Uh, as someone who also has a bit of experience in international affairs, I say that depends not on, on ICANN, it depends on the governments who happen to be the same governments who are represented in various organizations, ITU, GAC, United Nations, UNESCO, etc. So it's a question of the will of uh, sovereign states. So I, I wouldn't want to put the blame on ICANN for that. I think it would be unfair. It depends very much on two things. One, the level of rep representation, in other words, the appetite uh, to have a, a maximum feasible role within the GAC. And the second point is the working methods, which you must understand are different from those uh, of the engineering world you represent so well. Um, because in the um, government world, there is a process of consultation uh, at various levels which takes the time it takes. And admittedly, the smaller the country, the, uh, the shorter the consultation line and therefore process. Uh, we can try to improve that by uh, further consultation with the government representatives, but ultimately it does belong to the governments themselves. Uh, well, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I'd like to touch two points, and uh, in fact, they have to do with uh, the two points that have been uh, discussed so far since uh, the, the, this Namibia uh, participant has uh, intervened. So, in what concerns the GAC, um, just a comment. So, uh, I actually believe that it's, it's very important to work on the procedures and the working methods because, as you mentioned, the, this is a, a kind of a body and the, the, the type of, um, of uh, operation which actually requires a little, a little difference on the way usually uh, governments are represented and act on these instances. And I think a lot of improvement can be made, but it has to be worked out how to do it. Well, the other two things are obvious and have, they have been stated. I mean, wider participation, uh, is uh, is of course uh, uh, one uh, one of them, and uh, and the, the other the um, the 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 idea of uh, having a, a very uh, open visibility to the procedures of the organisation, so that you can take adv take advantage of the participation of different governments on that in terms of. Uh, sustaining the, 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 the acceptance of the organization and somehow resisting to external capture. Now, the other I'd like to formulate as a question, it, it is still on the line of what was raised here, is the, the scenarios for evolution of the institutional framework of ICANN. Okay, I understand that, of course, the United States administration has something to say about it, but anyway, I believe that it is to, to ICANN structure to write down and make clear which are the scenarios that we have in front and to make very clear analytical reasoning about each one of them and their possible consequences. So from this point of view, I'd like to know where you are. So uh, what is the present situation concerning which scenarios are in line and what analytical 
statements can be done about each one of them in terms of uh, consequences from a strategic point of view. I think that would be useful. Well, if not here, where can I see that sort of information? Thank you. Can I, can I ask, I mean, you, you mentioned scenarios. I mean, uh, are you referring to the scenarios that we presented in, in one of the workshops yesterday with, or? So, uh, unfortunately, I did not participate in the workshop, so I don't know what you are talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm talking generally, well, you see, there is presently an institutional framework that will finish very soon. I hope somebody has written down the possibilities of what can happen next. Either there is just one possibility or there is more than one. But when you say that it depends a lot on the, on the, on the position of the United States administration, I imagine there is more than one. So uh, is, that, is that work done? or people are just waiting for, for what will happen. By the way, I didn't identify myself before. Luis Magalhães from Portugal. Well, as a practitioner of international relations, uh, I'm going to be uncharacteristically imprudent by saying, OK, let's go ahead. Let's do that. Let's look at various scenarios. Let's take the no-move scenario. Nothing happens. Uh, someone and the new administration says, no, this is, you know, this is almost national security, no way, uh, nothing has to change. So obviously, it takes two to tango, and in any joint project or agreement with two partners, uh, if one of the partners doesn't want to change anything, well, that's it. So that's one scenario. Uh, however, I think I can speak on behalf of my colleagues of PSC in saying that that's not exactly what we're looking at. I think that the, there are a set of other possibilities or scenarios. One of them would be that uh, uh, the new uh, US leadership would recognize the fact that the basis, the logic on which the JPA was conducted and uh, renegotiated uh, has proven wise and has given the expected results. That's very important. And I think uh, Paul has uh, underlined this time and time again in the uh, ICANN public uh, meetings. Uh, there were a set of criteria, as it were, or things to achieve. And it is our feeling on the PSC that, by and large, the main elements have been satisfactorily met or undertaken by ICANN. For instance, transparency, accountability, yes, things need to be improved. And I, for one, was very impressed by the feedback we got on the fact that the no confidence vote, or the ultimate sanction, as it were, of uh, spilling the board was a, a nice thought, but not sufficient, and that we had to have a much more elaborate mechanism of accountability on the part of the ICANN board. So if you look at all the requirements which are set out uh, between the US government and ICANN, I think that uh, most of them have been met well or very well. The remaining work can be done without maintaining the quote unquote oversight of the US government. So. What we are uh, formulating and submitting to you and to the internet community at large is that, yes, we have achieved what we were supposed to achieve. And therefore, the international community can place its trust in ICANN as a model, as a rather original multi-stakeholder model and has to de be developed further. But it is our belief that 
oversight by one government, even though there is no dispute about the fact that for historic reasons it is the US government, it was not some other government. So that that oversight is no longer necessary. Where do we go from there? Well, uh, the whole point about um, protection against capture is precisely that because of this timeline of the possible termination of JPA, there could be at least a theoretical risk of an unfriendly takeover attempt by, call them entities, or entity. And that's why we consider that protection against uh, capture is so crucial. Now, my own answer to that is, there again as a practitioner, is that the more you have uh, a variety and numbers of participants or stakeholders, the more difficult any form of capture becomes. So we are fairly confident in that. My last point is, if you exclude or for the time being do not give undue advantage to the nothing's going to happen uh, scenario, how far can we go is really your question, sir, I think. Well, we are on the PSC believe that there are several factors which have been mentioned in Paul's presentation. One of them is meeting the global needs. And global needs is another form of saying internationalization. And I would like to address this especially to our friends from the United States who are in this hall and say that internationalization is not turning one's back on the United States. It has been made clear that for historic reasons, the headquarters are in California, and I think that it has been made clear that for the foreseeable future, that is not put into question. We do believe, however, that there is a very strong case for internationalization, including in the creation of other, I don't know how many, but other legal entities, sometimes for very practical reasons. For instance, a greater ease in recruiting, in managing contracts, etc. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, in Marina del Rey, some of these functions will disappear. It's simply that I think it is the duty of ICANN as an international entity to take care of its international stakeholders. And that can be done also and well in other, another location with another legal entity. Uh, you did notice, of course, our catchphrase, which is an additional legal entity. The, um, the paradox in which the ICANN is today is that we are we are speaking mainly about the, the, the JPA, and in fact, the uh, the real issue of ICANN is more related to the to the to the JANA functions than to the JPA. The JPA may continue or disappear, and nothing will will change. Nothing will change, and the real the real issue is the Jana functions. And uh, as is explained in one of the documents of the of the of the of the PSC, which is the the um, the uh, the, uh, the the Q and A uh, document. Where they, there are a lot of paragraphs about the general function, what are they? Um, the the general functions, it's, it's for ICANN, the general function is a contract. But this is a very, very special piece of contract. And many, many, uh, many American lawyers have, say, have, uh, have put their attention on that. Because this is a contract in which ICANN takes a lot of duties. Things that I can have to do, and he's not 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 paid for 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 doing doing that. 
And the, uh, in the old days before I can, this Yana Sancho were accessed by the University of South California. And the University of South California was paid for doing the, the functions that, 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 that I, 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 I can took. The, uh, the funny thing is that yesterday, Mr. Touré, maybe he didn't uh, realize the, 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 the kind of wording he, he was doing. He touched in his presentation two of the main general functions. One of these is the re-delegation and the de delegation. In definitely if the, it's true or not, what is said about Trinidad, which in fact is not, it's not, it's, it's not, not true, but uh, in definitely of that, the, the legitimacy of, of, uh, of ICANN for doing the work of, of delegation and re-delegation comes from the general functions. And uh, I'm not sure that the governments in the world would uh, accept to, to, uh, to uh, decide, and I don't know, in, I don't know in which grounds, to take the delegations from, from the Yana functions and from ICANN and put it in the, in the uh, in, in ITU or, or whatever. Hmm? Um, many, uh, in many countries, the, the, the country codes are not, the, uh, are not delegated to, to governmental organizations. They're, they're, they're delegated to universities or even to private companies. And the other one he touched, his, which is, uh, is the one in which is, it's, it's more near to me, is the, is the addressing. He said that the, uh, that the uh, ITU uh, has created a, a working group to, well, in the original declaration of the, of, of the WTSA, the, it was to handle, to handle the IPv6. We don't un understand what the term handle means. But in any case, in any case, a, a, a kind of consideration of that, a, that doesn't take in, in, in front all the enormous work that has been done through, through the years on the addressing. And this is a, a very robust situation for ICANN, because ICANN has an MOU with the, with the NRO and with the five RIRs, which is quite robust. And uh, independently, if the I can, I can find, uh, uh, if the uh, if the Yana function on addressing is signed or not signed, or, or the contract is signed or not signed, that will not move anything because the what is done, what, what happens in the now, is that the that the today, the Yana makes the allocation of the addresses in blocks to the RIRs, but the allocation uh, that Yana makes and I can as the contractor of the Yana function makes, is not made in, in, a, in, a, uh, in an arbitrary way. It's made following policies. Policies which were developed, were, were de de developed bottom up, and we explained to the GAC, and many governments have understood, that the real place to discuss the, those policies is to go to the, to the public forums in the RIRs and many governments, including the government of the United States. The government of the United States is quite present in ARIN, which is the, the, with the American registry. And uh, governments in, uh, in many other regions in Europe, in, La, in, La, in Latin America, in Africa also, and uh, in Asia, in, in, in every. Governments are coming to the public forums for the address policies. And in the old days, Ayana, in the old days, even in the, in the days before the existence of, 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 of ICANN, the, the uh, addressing policies, the, and, and what, that's the origin of what, is, what was, what, which is I'll call the, the legacy blocks addresses, were given without a policy. Now Ayana, Ayana works with policies, and those policies uh, exist even for, for the IPv4, and even for the, and, 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 and certainly also for the IPv6. And one of the things that, that was mentioned by in, in, the, in the WTSA de declaration, it was mentioned that, the, uh, that they were, uh, ITU could be the guarantee that, the, uh, that the, uh, there will be a fair distribution of the, of the, uh, the IPv6 and never happen again 
what happens with the with the with the IPv4. And the curious thing about this is that the the IPv6 policy is exactly a fair distribution. And now we have a, uh, the, the, a uh, every uh, every uh, RIR received the slash 12. So every region has exactly the same number of of, uh, of addresses. And the the rate of uh, of consumption today of the uh, of the uh, of the IPv6 means that probably we need three or four more years before an RR will be in condition to ask for a second slash, slash 12. So ITU has nothing to do with that because uh, because the uh, the distribution of IPv6 is quite fair. And the last thing I would like like to mention is that no longer than yesterday, the NRO uh, enacted the, the, the fact that the, uh, the, 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 the policy, which now has to be uh, forwarded by the, by the address council to the ICANN board to be ratified, a policy concerning the distribution of the, of the end of the, of the IANA pool on IPv4. And this end, when, the, when uh, the, there will be only five slash eight, this, this, this will be fair. So we have a sad story for the past, but the end of the pool will be fair. And that was a policy that was decided with the votes of government in many, in, many, in, in all the regions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will come back to the question on the interaction between GAC and ICANN. Uh, I understood and I also agree that uh, GAC uh, uh, have to uh, look on the working methods and the participation. I also understood that the, if there is an advice from, from the GAC up to now, it has been followed. If not, then uh, there will be uh, uh, in uh, certain comments back why it hasn't been followed. But don't you think there's an, a need for uh, more process in order to uh, to have a dialogue and, and uh, closing the gap if, if there is some difference? Uh, wouldn't it be wise uh, to, to go against government in, in the long run? Uh, don't you think there should be uh, a chance for uh, a dialogue in order to uh, to uh, narrow the difference between uh, ICANN and GAC if it's ever come to that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I think in my one of my previous answers, I, I, I said that uh, this is precisely what GAC wants to do, that is to say to increase dialogue and interaction between, uh, between the GAC and other uh, communities, other organizations of ICANN, and, and, and to do it at a stage when policies are being developed and formulated rather than just at the, at the very end, so that this is precisely the direction we would like to go. Thank you. I wonder if I can pick up on that, and I, I'll also just, when I'm interrupting, saying that uh, uh, Jean-Jacques may have to leave us shortly to, to chair another session. Um, can I take us back a little to understand the real significance of this discussion about the GAC and, and, and distinctions? At the heart of what ICANN's asked to do is an internet protocol that does not recognize geographic boundaries. The heart of this technology is different to every other technology it does, in the sense that it does not recognize geographic boundaries. And, and, and because the protocol itself is a dumb protocol, it will carry any content. As a consequence, it has been enormously, um, uh, an enormous spark for innovation for people at the edge of that network to put any application they can cr create to run across, across that protocol. Now, there are institutions that play a role in the, in, the, in the coordination and the distribution of unique identifiers that help 250,000 networks operate as one network and run that protocol. 
and they are registries and registrars, the original internet registries, um, and there are others. Particularly when it comes to the top level domains, the generic top level domains, and those registrars. These are people who operate businesses that are available to every citizen of the world who can access the internet. It's an instantly global service running on a global technology. So the interesting challenge is if you're going to try to set rules for that, how do you do that? Because it doesn't recognize national jurisdictions. And you can try to put national jurisdiction uh, law in place, but I think the last 15, 20 years of discussion around this consistently says that's not a not feasibility. And, and to take a European example, a little bit out of the experience of the Hanseatic League or people like that, you know, what, what, what has merged in this space in the internet generally has been the use of contract. And contract has been the mechanism whereby the rules get set for how those, how those operators work. In the ICANN model, there's a piece of genius, I think, in those contracts, in that the contracts are, are like you know, many operational, con you know, sort of license type contracts, if you want to put it that way. And they have a clause in them which says you have to, con you have to abide by consensus policy. Consensus policy is the process whereby the bottom-up participatory sort of policy-making body gets to change the contracts over time. And there aren't too many contracts in the world, or license agreements around the world, which says, we will get to change your license terms on a regular basis. You don't know how, but we will. Right? I can see Chuck and a few others nodding here because they're people who have won these contracts. But think about this. This is a piece of, this is a piece of governance that is really, it's unique. And it's worked very well. It is contracts that, allow, that, that set the rules for how these operators operate a global business, but which says you are going to be accountable to a, to a, to a participatory political international process which is going to change your contract terms <laughs> as issues emerge that they think are important to be changed, particularly for registrants. Now let's think about who needs to be involved in that process. It needs to have users. It needs to have um, intellectual property interests. It needs to have uh, other country code operators. And it needs to have governments absolutely involved. But as someone who has been both an, a diplomat and the head of a government agency, as well as where I am now, the thing that strikes me most about this process, which is very interesting, is that because of those contracts, this is a piece of work where policy op and operations are closely intertwined. There are areas in government activity where it is quite fine to separate policy from operations, and many governments do this. I mean, you've seen this in telecoms environment. Ministries of communication separated from the regulator, separated from the operator. You know, these sort of co these concepts of separation of roles and who does the policy and who does the implementation. But because of this construct of contracts that have a consensus policy uncertainty term in them, frankly, which is available for, available for amendment, the policy and the implementation are intertwined. And that's where I think the evolution of what the Government Advisory Committee increasingly has been doing, which is to be involved with the other players in active discussion of the identity of the issues and how issues need to get implemented and what issues need to be considered in those changes is essential. It, this is one of those areas, and there are, I mean, you know, I've seen many areas in domestic policy and governments where that takes place, where the integration of policy and operations happens and people talk about how this is going to work. Can I give a very concrete example? The Governmental Advisory Committee worked through a set of principles they thought were important for new generic top-level domains. And in, those, and in those principles, they had a series of clauses that referred to previous principles they'd worked through on about geopolitical terms, geographical terms, and, and geographical countries and names and, 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 and places, and um, etc. Now, they worked that through inside the room, and they, they came with that policy. And that, that we then took that at the, at the staff level and actually sat down and said, OK, how do we implement this? Because we have to turn this into a contract, which has to be the terms that run these, set the rules for how, this, how these businesses work globally. And frankly, some of the things we could do and some of the things, you, when you went to put them into operations, they were just too vague. So we went back to them. We went back in phone calls. We went back in teleconferences and discussions and in letters and said, well, listen, we think we can achieve it this way. But what about this? And then we'd have a conversation on the phone, and people would say, well, that's not what we intended. Oh, we hadn't thought of that. No, no, OK, that's not what our intention was. Our intention was this. Oh, OK, that's good to know. Let's write that down. And there's an example of a, of a, of a, of a you know, real-time integration between people who are responsible to, opt to implement and people responsible who are thinking about the pol public policy implements actually talking together about, well, how do we make this work? Now, that discussion is not yet finished. 
but I think it's going to end up with an outcome that's going to be actionable and people will feel the public policy need, as they saw it, I think, will be implemented. We've yet to see. Now, that's not the sort of model. If that's, if that's, if that's what you need to actually you know, make these sort of ongoing changes to these contracts that set the rules for how these organisations